Hello, my wonderful Catamania listeners. If you've been following me for a while, you are probably aware that I have set a set of slogans that have taken off that many of you really love. Some of them have become some serious beliefs and even missions. Like for example, if something doesn't fit within your budget, I believe that you should just increase the budget. That a true dream job is to be a manager of husband's bank accounts. Now, some of these slogans have become serious missions. Like, for example, that we must resuscitate chivalry. Now, if you want to join me on any of these missions, or if you simply vibe with any of my slogans, you can now purchase my merch at mbhtv.com backslash collections backslash catamania you also have a chance to win five thousand dollars if you purchase any of the pieces between now and end of july the winner will be announced on my instagram on july 29th good luck i find it very important to stress there is no such thing as being transgender transition is something people do not something they are you're still a boy or a girl but we're not allowed to call it a mental illness anymore as a 10 year old you can say you're the opposite sex and your parents don't agree, you're at risk of losing your child to Child Protective Services. But here in BC, for example, there's one psychologist who works for the Ministry of Children and Family Development. He said he's personally transitioning more than 1,000 kids, including more than 500 in the foster system. There are only 6,000 kids in foster care in British Columbia. I want to welcome everyone back to Catamania. I have Chris Elston with me here today. My main job in life is that of a dad. I've got two girls. I came across this term puberty blockers, and I said to myself, that doesn't sound very good. Stopping healthy children's physical development. For me, this is the greatest child abuse scandal in modern medicine history. There are children. They're not the state's children. Yeah. We don't co-parent with the government. But then you've got politicians stating that there is no such thing as parental rights in Canada. There are parental responsibilities. Welcome everyone back to Catamania and thank you for tuning in and just to remember to hit the like button, subscribe, uh, yeah, whatever the like button is on the platform that you're listening to this on. If you click that, I would appreciate it. It means more than you know. Um, I have Chris Elston with me here today. Chris, would you mind just introducing yourself? I know you chatted a little bit um, earlier about how you used to work in finance, how you got to where you are today. Sure. So yeah, I used to work in finance. I've had a few different jobs, but my main job in life is that of a dad. I've got two girls. I'm married. I live out in South Surrey, 45 minutes from Vancouver. And in 2019, I started learning about this business of trying to change the sex of children. And I think I came across this term puberty blockers. And I said to myself, what are those? That doesn't sound very good. And of course, these are drugs doing exactly what they sound like. We're blocking puberty in perfectly healthy children, stopping healthy children's physical development. And this is affecting mostly girls. So I started researching this and I guess I became obsessed with it because for me, this is the greatest child abuse scandal in modern medicine history. And it's primarily affecting girls. Mm. And I see this like a cult that has infected the entire Western civilization, teaching these kids that they might have been born in the wrong body, which I think is extraordinarily abusive on its own. The positive message we should be sending kids is they're beautiful just as they are, not that they need to be something they're not, not that they were born wrong based on a feeling. And when you look at the data and you start really digging into this, a majority of these kids are on the autism spectrum. A ton of them have been sexually abused. A lot of kids are in foster care. It's kids who've had trauma and abuse and they're just not fitting in. They're having a tough time and puberty can be hard, especially for girls. Yeah. But here in BC, for example, there's one psychologist who works for the Ministry of Children and Family Development. His name's Wallace Wong. And he gave a talk at the Vancouver Public Library about five years ago, where he said he's personally transitioning more than 1,000 kids, including more than 500 in the foster system. There are only 6,000 kids in foster care in British Columbia. One psychologist is transitioning 500 of them, 8%. So that's totally insane. He sends them to the children's hospital where whether their parents approve or not, because parental approval is not needed in British Columbia or in many other jurisdictions as well. But they'll give them the puberty blockers, the cross sex hormones, and they're doing double mastectomies on minor children. Just about three or four weeks ago, 
I heard from a nurse who used to work for Trans Health BC that they had just cut off the breasts of a 12-year-old girl who thinks she's a boy. This is insane. And yet none of our politicians speak up about it. And I felt that no one in society at large was really talking about this much. Certainly not in a productive way. There was a lot of divisive rhetoric and people were kind of stuck in their own silos, in their own echo chambers. There's a lot and of confusion. There's a lot of confusion yeah. because the terminology around this is very confusing. Yeah. Ask people on the street what a trans woman is. They don't know if it's a male or a female. Right. It's like a mathematical equation. You know, if you see those videos of like, I'm... Um, I'm a transgender, cis, like, I didn't even know those terms, right? And I'm not trying to put anybody down, but, you know, it, it all changed so quickly. And this is, again, coming from some of my friends who are, who were members of LGBTQ, you know, plus community, gay men, primarily gay men who speak up about this now, who say, hey, this isn't what we fought for at all. Like, we don't want to even be associated with that movement anymore because... That just doesn't seem right to us. And all these, all this terminology that came out, and you're right, you, you know, you get so confused, you don't really know what's going on, and then you hear about gender dysphoria, and you're like, well, that sounds, that sounds really serious. So maybe some people do have gender dysphoria. But then also, when a child, like I remember, I had a coworker who she had two daughters, and one of her daughters just kept saying, "I'm a boy," and that was way before you know all of these things started to happen. Um, maybe not way before, but like a few years before, and they kind of talked to her and figured out that because she was an old, the older sister, she was spending more time with her dad. So she was kind of associating with her dad more. So she was walking around saying, oh, I'm a boy. I must be a boy because I'm spending time with my dad. And I reflected on that as I was driving here today. And I thought to myself, I wonder if that would have happened now and she would have gone to school and she would have voiced that to her teachers. Is there a risk that she, the teacher would have been like, oh, hey, you think you're a boy? Maybe we should help you transition then. Yes. Yeah, so the standard practice among the psychology profession, all the counselors, and a lot of teachers, depends who you get. But the standard practice now is to affirm only mm. a child's self-diagnosis as being born in the wrong body. They don't challenge it. They don't look into what the other underlying mental health comorbidities are because there are always other mental health issues going on. The majority of these kids, according to data that we have, have five or more coexisting mental health comorbidities but those aren't getting treated. They treat gender as though it's the source of all the problems. Mm. Whereas, again, if you look historically, I mentioned these statistics about how a lot of these kids grew up to be gay. And most of them saw their gender dysphoria just go away because the cure for this distress that they're feeling is puberty itself. It's growing up. Now we block the cure. But historically, uh, these kids, like I mentioned, 88% grew out of it. I would say it would be even higher now because these were kids, one out of 30,000, who had this distress from a very young age that persisted into their teenage years. And then it still went away. What's happening today is girls who never felt this growing up, who get to be 14 or 15 years old, and they're having a tough time. And this is being presented as the reason for their distress. What can you or what do you have to approve as a parent for your child? Uh, meaning like, you know, there's many things that you can do before you're 18 years old. You need your parents approval. Yes. What are those things? Well, you have to have your parents approval to get a tattoo. Right. You can't smoke. You can't drink. You can't drive. You can't have sex with adults, obviously, but you can now change your sex without parental approval. As a 10 year old, you can say you're the opposite sex. And if you're very insistent on it and your parents don't agree, you're at risk of losing your child to child protective services. Has that happened? It happens. In Victoria, there's a mom that I've been speaking with for almost four years. She reached out to me when I'd started my campaign and they had just moved to Victoria. She just separated from her husband. So this is very traumatic for her daughter, who I think was in grade five or six at the time. Mm -hmm. And her daughter developed very early, not fun for girls, of course. And she was just having a tough time. I think she's also got ADHD and she might be on the autism spectrum. And on the very first day of school, the teacher asked the class for their preferred name and pronouns. And right then and there, this girl decided she was a boy. And they didn't tell her mom. They sent her to the school counselor 
who was coaching this girl on where to get breast binders without her mom knowing. That was in school. That was her teacher. The school counselor. Wow. And the teacher, of course, started this process. And her mom found out about this and put a stop to it at school. She actually talked to the school counselor who lied to her three times during the interview, but she recorded it. And she was able to prove this counselor was lying about what she was doing behind her back. And she played that recording for the principal and the principal was on the mom's side. But then the girl was getting counseling outside of school and she was starting to do better towards the end of the school year. But the school counselor found out she wasn't getting any counseling anymore because she'd been doing better and they'd stopped for a while. So she called CPS. She saw it as a red flag. So CPS interviewed the mom, the daughter, the ex-husband, all CPS separately. CPS is just for... Child Protective Services. Okay. And yes, there's absolutely a risk they can take your child away. There's a bill in Canada that was passed unanimously called Bill C-4, which made it a criminal offense to commit the crime of conversion therapy. And these bills are passing all over the world. And there's really always two components to them. It makes it a crime to try to change someone's sexual orientation. And you know, most people go along with that. They're fine with that. We shouldn't try to make gay people straight. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. But then they use that to get public approval for these bills. But the real purpose of these bills is this gender identity component, which they don't talk about as much. But it makes it a crime if your child identifies as transgender to make them cisgender, this made up term that we should never use because we should use terms based in reality. But it's fine to convince your girl that she's a boy. It's not okay to help her feel comfortable with her body. It's fine to convince her she's a boy and that she should become a lifelong pharmaceutical patient without her breasts, sterilized, never be able to have kids. It's fine to turn these boys into anorgasmic lifelong pharmaceutical patients because according to the president of the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, a man who says he's a woman named Marcy Bowers, he admitted in a Zoom call that I tweet out all the time that none of the boys who started on puberty blockers at what's called Tanner Stage 2 so Tanner stage two is the beginning of puberty, mm -hmm. scientific term for it. For girls, this is probably two years before they first had their, had their first period. So these are little kids, they're 10, 11. But none of the boys have been able to have an orgasm as an adult. So they're taking that away from these kids. What 11 year old boy who doesn't even understand what that means can possibly consent to giving that up? To What girl can consent? I mean, you don't even know what those things are. Yes, and what what young girl can consent, give informed consent, fully understanding the ramifications right. of sterilizing herself? They well, give these probably they give want these your kids period test to go away too. I remember, yeah. it wasn't that long ago I got, you know, it was a while ago, but I remember going through puberty. It was awful. It was actually an awful experience because you don't really, it's uncomfortable, right? You have to go to school, you have to do all these things. It was uncomfortable. I thought a couple of times, I have a brother, so I thought a couple of times, must be nice to be a boy, you know? But sure. I'm glad I went through it and I'm a woman and I'm really you know, happy to be in my body. What happens yeah. with specifically gender dysphoria? Well, so in that example, yes. So you give these girls testosterone yeah. and they're giving testosterone to 12 year olds, even younger. In the US, the NIH, the National Institute of Health, gave a grant to four different children's hospitals and as part of that grant was approval to give testosterone to eight-year-old girls provided they were already hitting puberty which is going to be pretty rare but it happens sometimes but they're eight right they believe in santa claus and now you're giving them testosterone what does testosterone do after four or five years these girls have to get a hysterectomy they're doing oophorectomies where they cut out their ovaries as well they're sending teenaged girls into menopause which has a hundred side effects of its own. And we're supposed to say this is loving and inclusive when these kids all have other mental health issues going on as well. This is child abuse, pure and simple. This is for all practical purposes, a cult that is spread throughout the West. There's no basis at all to gender identity. And we call it gender dysphoria, but most of these kids don't even have that. They have something else going. What on. is gender dysphoria? Because th distress. that does exist, right? Yeah, sure. It's just yeah. distress is all it is. It's distress about your sex. Right. So you had all these little boys who were really upset going back in, in history. They didn't want to be boys. They wanted to be girls. Most of them grew out of it, more than 80%. And a majority, according to all academic studies, and they're all up on my website, before they started drugging these kids, the majority grew up to be gay. So yes, some gay people are totally against this now because they get it. A lot are not, and they're pushing it mm -hmm. because they 
they they kind of project their own upbringing onto these kids because maybe they had a tough time growing up. They got bullied because they were a bit different, and they just see that these kids are a bit different, but they've never put any thought into it. Does gender dysphoria though exist as a as a medical condition? Is that yes, it's in the DSM five. Can you actually be born? I guess with both. I don't know if you can be born so, with both chromosomes. I have absolutely so no. no idea what I'm talking about here. So, so I, I'm that's just curious. okay. Yeah, yeah. So gender dysphoria is just distress. That's all it is. It's not a physical thing. Okay. It's a mental thing. Okay. Now, what the trans activists try to do is they try to muddy the waters of this conversation by saying, well, what about intersex people? Now, intersex is really a misnomer. Nobody is inter anything when it comes to their sex. Every single person who's ever been born is either male or female. There's no such thing as true hermaphroditism with humans. There are various medical conditions, and the proper terminology for this is disorders of sexual development. And there are various conditions that people have where, yeah, there might be some ambiguity with their genitalia in like 0.018% of the population, because maybe, maybe these boys have some condition called Kleinefelter syndrome, where their testes are internalized. Mm. And there's different conditions. And it's but it doesn't important. happen nearly as often as, as we're told. No, not at all. They try to say that this is as common as redheaded people, which is just complete and utter nonsense. It's extremely rare, and it's got nothing to do with this conversation because we're talking about just normal, healthy kids having a tough time in life who've been deceived into believing that they were born wrong mm -hmm. and that they'll only find true happiness by trying to become something they're not and by trying to become something they can never become. Right. Because transition is just body modification. That's all it is. There's no such thing as a transgender child. They're called girls and boys. Transition is just body modification. And now we're modifying the bodies and we're sterilizing 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 year olds who've got other issues going on in life. And it's not just me saying this. We have now, especially several other countries which have conducted systematic reviews of all of the scientific literature to back up everything I'm saying. So in England, probably the most thorough report that's been done the past few years is called the Cass Review by a pediatrician named Dr. Hilary Cass. She spent almost four years writing this report, doing the research. It's 388 pages long. And the outcome of this was there is no evidence at all to support transitioning kids. So they've stopped puberty blockers in England. They've stopped puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones in Scotland. They basically stopped this in Finland, in Sweden, Denmark. The Academy of Medicine in France stated that it's impossible to tell which children will grow out of this and which will not. The Senate is passing legislation to stop this. 25 states have passed legislation to stop this. Down in Oregon, their medical authorities know this because they did their own review, but then they buried it. And this is new news as of about a week ago. They buried this report that this wasn't helping kids, and they kept hurting these kids anyway. And there's a lot of progress going on all over the world. There are tons of wins happening. Except there, Canada. Even Canada has a little <laughs> bit of progress. There's, there are a lot of lawsuits now flying in the U.S. representing these detransitioners. Right. Because those are the voices we really need to listen to. Mm. People like Chloe Cole, who had a double mastectomy at 15. She'd been sexually abused. She's on the autism spectrum. This girl, Layla Jane, who was 13 years old in one month when they cut off her breasts at Kaiser Permanente. She's suing. There's a new law firm that formed in Texas, four dads, 18 kids between them. They felt a calling to fight for these kids. So they now have more than a dozen lawsuits going on. And in every state that passed legislation to stop this, the ACLU or the Department of Justice started to sue. And that's great because when they sue, well, you have to present your evidence and they don't have any. And they're losing and this is now going to the Supreme Court, which is great. But here in Canada, we're a bit behind, but Saskatchewan and New Brunswick have tried to get gender ideology out of schools. They're working on that. And in Alberta, the premier, Danielle Smith wants to stop giving puberty blockers to kids under 16 years of age. So mm. that's a start. It's not perfect, right. but it's a start. The, uh, the teaching of it in school is what started to get me. Because as I told you, you know, in the beginning of this conversation, I, I'm all about freedom of the individual. But when it started to get to people who, or to kids who can't, they don't know what's going on, right? Is when I started, w when it started to become a thing about kids is when I got a little bit alarmed. I was like, wait a minute, that just does not seem right. I don't remember learning that stuff in school. I, I just don't, I don't think it's appropriate and I would feel uncomfortable if I was a parent and I knew that my child was going to school and they were being taught this stuff at such a young age. Like it's just, I feel like it's a conversation that they should have with their parents, not their teachers. 
And the parents should decide when to have that conversation with them. Absolutely right. And by the time you're a parent, we're going to fix this. But the policy... <laughs> Thanks, you're working. You're, I'm working for you, <laughs> for your future. The policy, written policy by the BC Teachers Federation is to hide from parents when a child says they're trans. How do we get here? Like, how do we get to a situation where we can't define what a woman is, where we're fighting about biological males taking... That's another thing that really alarmed me. I was like, wait, biological males can now compete with women? And what? And like mm -hmm. win every single time pretty much, right? And by a lot. How did we get here? How did this start? How like, This just seems like madness and chaos all around. How much time you got? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. So, we're like half hour in, <laughs> a little bit less. Oh, boy. So... Gender identity, the term itself, was coined in the 60s by a man named Robert Stoller. It was popularized by this doctor named John Money at Johns Hopkins University who experimented on a Canadian boy named David Reimer who unfortunately had a circumcision go badly that burned off his penis when he was eight months old. And his mother and father, together with John Money, decided to raise this boy as a girl and not tell him he was really a boy. They castrated him completely. They made a fake vagina for him. They dressed him like a girl, grilled his hair, changed his name, and didn't tell him he was a boy. It's totally insane. But there's a great documentary on this by the BBC. I encourage people to watch because this is too long to get into today. But he ended up killing himself when he was an adult. John Money had them doing pedophilic things to each other, him and his twin brother, when he was meeting with them. And from John Money spawned this idea of gender identity, which really floated around academia for a long time. It was then popularized by feminist scholars like Judith Butler out of UC Berkeley. And the teaching amongst all these feminists, modern day feminists, because there's several different waves of feminism 100%. and there's no real one definition of feminism, but modern feminism teaches that our gender is a social construct, that it's all just dependent on your environment, on stereotypes, on how you're raised, etc. That if you were a masculine girl, well, maybe you're a boy. Really? What a negative message. My message is there's no right or wrong way to be a boy or girl. Right. That's there's nothing the wrong with you being a more masculine woman or a more feminine guy. You are what you are. Yeah. But you're not the opposite sex. Right. But now the words sex and gender, I mean, the left, it, this was really pushed by the far left. And they've taken the word gender, which we used as a synonym for sex. And they've been teaching that it's something else entirely. And so this really comes out of academia. And then in the first decade of this century, really probably up until 2015, in all these Western countries, there was this battle for gay rights and gay marriage. And every country pretty much in the West mm -hmm. passed those laws. Whatever, I don't care. But what happens with all these nonprofit organizations that were fighting for this? They don't close the doors and say, we won. Good job, everybody. We achieved our objective. They move on to the next objective. They have to keep donations flowing. They need to keep the doors open and keep everyone employed. And for the left, really, when I say the left, I'm referring to the far left, who have really hijacked the entire left. It's the extremists. Like the woke movement yeah. and such, yeah. What they want is perpetual revolution. They don't want a revolution. They want to exist in a constant state of revolution. And they're always looking to introduce the next concept and to normalize that. So when gay rights were won, the new objective for all of these nonprofits, and there are hundreds of millions of dollars we're talking about here pushing this, their new objective became trans rights, and they've been successful in conflating trans rights with gay rights. That's why everyone calls it the LGBT community. It's not a community. There's LGB. That's not even a community. You don't have a ton of lesbians hanging out with gay men. But there's LGB, which is sexual orientation. There's transgenderism, which is a denial of reality. There's queer theory, which is an attempt to tear down all the norms in society and all traditions when it comes to sex and sexuality. And they've put all these letters together, which scares people from speaking up. Mm -hmm. Because if you said anything about this trans movement, oh, you're a bigot. You might get fired from your job. Mm -hmm. so people who are confused about this, who don't understand, are going to look at you badly. And so hardly anyone was speaking up. Even the doctors weren't speaking up. A lot of them didn't know about this because much of this was done in secrecy. This is done in one little corner of BC Children's Hospital, for example, by a few doctors and a social worker and a nurse. And they're seeing a thousand kids a year with a waiting list. 
but the rest of the doctors in the hospital don't know about it because they're doing their own practice. And the GPs have been sending kids to gender clinics thinking, well, it's a gender clinic, that, that's their specialty. We'll send them there. But they don't realize that there's no science to this at all. This is all ideology. But this is changing now. As you mentioned, a lot of gay people are now speaking up. Yeah. Tons of parents are speaking up. My, you know, my main focus in this whole campaign has been to reach parents so they can protect their own kids. But I also know when I do that and I teach people about this, that some of them are going to get fired up. They're going to become fighters in this as well. And so that's happened, especially in the States. I have so much support down there. But it's happening here in Canada, too. We had 30,000 people protest across the country last September against gender ideology. And so it's just one of those things that happen. And it combines with social media, mm -hmm. where kids have never grown up on social media before. This is the first generation ever to be exposed to social media. And a lot of parents have been negligent, letting their kids just scroll away on TikTok and Tumblr and Reddit and whatever. And it's extremely damaging to their mental health. Instead of living their own lives, they're watching other kids live their lives. And so it's just been this perfect storm of different things coinciding. And here we are with now, in the United States, 300,000 children between the ages of 12 and 17 have been diagnosed with gender dysphoria. You can extrapolate that into Canada. It's going to be in the tens of thousands here for sure. Every school has kids now identifying as trans, yet no one can define what it means. So what do, what's, what's the response that you get when you ask people to define it? When you, when you go into the protests, which we'll talk about in a minute here, when you ask people, define they can't. Some will say, well, I don't know because I'm not trans. Okay. And I'll say, well, don't you think we should be able to define these terms if we're going to be sterilizing kids and cutting off their body parts? Or some will tell me, well, you know, girls, they like, you know, nail polish and long hair. And I'll say, okay, so if a boy likes nail polish, does that make him a girl? Marilyn Manson liked nail polish, still probably does, right? Probably. A lot of rock stars. Yeah. In that movie, what is a woman? Um, I can't recall her name, but I'm sure you know her. She, she was a psychiatrist, a blonde lady. Miriam Grossman. She, yes. She gave a lot of really, um, I mean, a lot of information in this respect. And she mentioned, and you will know this better than me. Um, she mentioned specifically that there are people who do, in fact, have gender dysphoria and they are transgender, but it's a very small percentage of the population, much smaller than what we are seeing now. So... Yeah, she'll acknowledge that, yes, some children have gender dysphoria, which is mm -hmm. just extreme distress about their sex. That doesn't mean they're transgender. Transgender is just a label that leftists have given to this. But I find it very important to stress there is no such thing as being transgender. Transition is something people do, not something they are. They're boys and girls. So if you have gender dysphoria, that doesn't mean you're transgender. It means you have a, a mental condition. You have distress about your sex. You're still a boy or a girl. Biologically, it's still the same. Th there's no change. The, the, the same thing going on inside. Is that correct? 100%. Mm. They're just boys and girls. And they're having some difficulty in life. Mm -hmm. But almost all of these kids grow out of it if you leave them alone. Mm. And that's another thing the left denies. They don't know what they're saying. Sometimes they'll say it's a myth that gender identity ever changes. And then in their next breath, they'll say gender identity is fluid. You can be a girl one day, you can be a boy the next, you can be non-binary, you can be neither. You can be both. This is literally their teachings. It's totally insane. But I think it's very important to get away from the terminology that the left uses because that's how this has become so popular. We just have to get back to common sense and use real terms that describe real things. I can define for you what a boy or a girl is, a man or a woman. None of the people in Matt Walsh's film, none of the experts, the leading authorities in universities in the world could even define what a woman is. How insane is that? But there is a definition. A woman is someone who does or did or will or would, if not for genetic or developmental abnormalities, like these disorders of sexual development. A woman is someone who produces eggs. A man is someone who produces sperm. Our sex is defined by our gametes that we produce, not even our chromosomes, because there are occasionally chromosomal abnormalities. But yes, we are bodies. <laughs> And there's reality to that. This is all a world of unreality being pushed on kids. If an adult, a mature adult, wants to do something to their body, that's their right. Yeah. 18 year olds, 19 year olds who have autism, who've had sexual abuse, whose brains are still forming, our prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain responsible for logical decision making, doesn't finish forming until we're 25. I don't think we should be doing this to 18 and 19 year olds. And doctors who have sworn an oath to first do no harm, 
are never obligated to do any of this. If someone wants to get their leg cut off because they identify as a one-legged man, do doctors do that? No. That's an actual condition called apotemnophilia. And decades ago, someone did cut off the leg of a man. And they put, this, they put a stop to this very quickly. But just a few months ago in Eastern Canada, they cut off two fingers, the fourth and fifth fingers of someone, because he felt like these fingers didn't belong. This is like the same thing as gender dysphoria, essentially. Feeling like it's just not right. It doesn't belong. This is a mental illness. But we're not allowed to call it a mental illness anymore. The, the activists want to pretend this isn't a mental illness. And they've turned this into a civil rights movement. But if you think you're something you're not, that's called a delusion. And that's not hate. That's reality. It's not hateful to tell someone the truth. It's hateful to affirm a lie especially with children. It's extremely hateful. And what's happened now? You have a social contagion affecting girls where entire friend groups of girls come out as transgender. It's not just one here and there. It's this one, it's her friend, and it's her other best friend. Really? How does that work? Did you see um, ever the clip where Jordan Peterson was talking about um, the CEO of Disney, the new CEO of Disney? And I guess she has two children and she mentioned in an interview that both of them, like one of them is transgender and the other, like there, there's, right. both of them identified as, as basically, I think, transgender, something like that. And Jordan Peterson gave the numbers of the likelihood of that happening to both of your children, which is very, very low. Right. And she just confidently said, like, both of my children identify as... Gee, I wonder where that came from. An older study, when this affected just a handful of the population, and it was mostly boys, showed that 52% of the mothers of the boys with gender dysphoria. 52% of the moms had borderline personality disorder compared to 6% of the general population. Mm. So yes, a lot of times this is pushed by the parents. A lot of times it isn't. It's social media, it's school, it's video games. Kids are talking to other kids playing video games. Mm -hmm. There's a young woman who came out with me to the University of Washington. She was 22 when I met her. At 16, she was having depression in life. She was playing video games talking to other people online and these two people she was talking to on the other side of the world convinced her the source of her distress was because she was transgender and so at 16 she had a double mastectomy and she went on testosterone at 19 she had deep regrets and detransitioned but you can't actually detransition that's something i was going to ask you because i have heard the narrative before that it's not permanent and if you want to detransition you can can you speak to that a little bit well, if someone's cut off your breasts, they don't grow back. <laughs> and, you know, I don't say that as a joke. I mean, this is true. A lot of times it, they can't even get implants because yeah. the skin is too tight or whatever, and they can't even do it. Um, and as for the puberty blockers and opposite sexes hormones, well, too many years on testosterone and you have vaginal and uterine atrophy. So they're getting hysterectomies. You can't implant a new uterus. These kids are sterilized forever. Their voice, the girls' voices are deep. They've got hair all over their bodies. That's not going to go away. Yeah, they can try to get electrolysis and all that, but this is a problem forever. They're going to have a deep voice forever. It might go up a little bit, but they're suffering irreversible damage, to borrow the term from Abigail Schreier's book on this subject. And they're giving this irreversible damage to children who believe in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. Right. So it's child abuse, pure and simple. We need to stop this entirely with children. And we need to get gender ideology out of schools. Because, of course, if you teach something in schools, kids are going to believe it. It's coming from the number one or two authority figure in their life. Of course they're going to believe it. And look at any evil movement throughout history. Every youth in Germany was required to join the Hitler Youth. Why? Because that's how you change a culture quickly. You get to the kids. Mao did the same thing. Lenin did the same thing. This is just psych psychology and tactics repeating itself. Because, yeah, of course they're going to try to indoctrinate the kids. These are activists whose whole life revolves around trying to push this into society. What's and the reason behind it? Why? They're zealots. This is like a cult. They're like cult members. I don't say that to be hyperbolic. If you look at all cults, this has all the same 
hallmarks. People self-police their own thoughts. They don't allow themselves to look at the evidence. They'll separate themselves from their family members. They'll scream at you and call you a bigot and refuse to engage in conversation if you disagree. That's not rational discourse. That's not how rational, logical people act. We should be able to have a conversation. Right. So that's why I started doing what I do, going outside, because this conversation wasn't happening in the real world very much at all. Mm -hmm. Online, there were probably only five men of any significance who were even talking about this when I started. And, you know, when you are passionate about something and you know you have the truth on your side, which I do, and I have girls myself, I don't want to send them into a world that doesn't know what a woman is or a world trying to change the sex of children. When you have kids, your life stops being about yourself. How old are you? Or it should stop being about yourself. They're 12 and 14 now. So does does having them motivate you to continue to do this? Yeah, of course. Yeah. This is if I hadn't had kids I wouldn't have started this. Right. Maybe I would have, but that would be kind of weird. <laughs> if you don't have I don't know. Um no, of course that's I my don't have number kids one. And I'm I'm curious about what's happening and certain things just don't really seem to align, yeah. you know, but it's interesting to me to talk to parents because I have friends who are parents. I have you know, I know parents and it just seems like they should have a little bit more control and authority over what's happening with their child, right? Uh, of course, there are children. Mm -hmm. They're not the state's children. Yeah. We don't co-parent with the government. But then you've got politicians like this guy from Vancouver Island, Randall Garrison, I think his name is. He gave a talk in, at Parliament earlier this year, last year, stating that there is no such thing as parental rights in Canada. There are parental responsibilities. Interesting. He's a gay man pushing this. A lot of them do. A lot of them are against it. It's a total split. But that's totally insane. You're going to go, go talk to any parent. He's not a parent. You tell them they have no rights over their kids. Whose kids are they? They belong to the state? That's how these people think. So the, there's so many problems with this. There's freedom of speech issues going on. Right. I put up a big billboard. The first thing I did in Vancouver was I put up a big billboard, an actual billboard, which is where my nickname first came from, Billboard Chris. And it said the very controversial, I love J.K. Rowling. I heart J.K. Rowling is what it said on Hastings Street. She got into a lot of a lot of shit for speaking uh, what she spoke about, which, yeah. Yeah, she's yeah. told the truth. Yeah. She's a feminist. She's a leftist. But she thinks, for some strange reason, that male rapists don't belong in women's prisons. <laughs> and women's sports. Men shouldn't be in women's sports. My gosh. What a bigot. <laughs> it's, it's, this is all crazy. But she spoke out about this. A woman in the UK put up a sign at the Edinburgh train station that said, I love J.K. Rowling. It got taken down after one day. That was in July of 2020. And I got tired of this. And I said, forget it. This is outrageous. You can't even say you love the world's greatest children's author. And I was reading Harry Potter every night with my little one at the time, at bedtime. And so I put up a big, big billboard that said the same thing. And then a Vancouver councillor politician said it was hate speech. And she pressured the sign company and they took it down. So I was ready for that. I leveraged all the outrage into a quick little fundraising campaign. And a week later, I had another billboard up in San Francisco. And then Portland, LA, all throughout Utah, all throughout the metro in Washington, D.C. And then Times Square. That was my September of 2020. Very busy. But then because I now can't put up a sign in Canada and I'm nobody. I have no platform. I used to just have a regular job. I did the only thing I could do, which was go outside with some signs. And I wear them just because it's easier. I don't want to hold them all day. And I started having conversations because this whole campaign I'm having is about having conversations to raise awareness, one conversation at a time. Right. So you weren't deliberately going in for, you know, to put anyone down or judge. You were just trying to have a conversation. All I'm doing is having conversations. Yeah. I'm extremely calm. I don't approach anybody. I don't have a loudspeaker. Yeah. I just stand there quietly and I wait for people to come up and talk to me. And a few times I've gone to some protests. I hardly ever do that. But I've gone to some because I think it's important to present the counter narrative. We've got all these people celebrating a child abuse cult out on the street and no one offering any opposition. There needs to be opposition. So once in a while I'll go out and do that. And especially in Canada, violence tends to happen. And sometimes just standing on my own I get sucker punched or whatever. But... I've had my arm broken by Antifa in Montreal. I got jumped by six people there. A guy swung a traffic cone at my head four times. I blocked it each time with my forearm, but the base on those things is thick and it snapped this bone here, the ulna. What's the police response? Uh, in Canada, oftentimes extremely weak. So in that case in Montreal, 
The investigator didn't even start investigating for a month. I said, you'd better hurry because you're going to lose the street footage. And he contacted me almost a month later and he'd lost the street footage. Some of the people had jumped in a car and taken off. He could have just got their license plate. So why do the police not want to get involved? What's their reasoning for it? This is politically right. not favorable. When and somebody gets assaulted physically for anything. Well, my, my position is not with our insane politicians. It's not politically favorable at the moment, even though I'm, of course, the one telling the truth and they're the ones pushing child abuse. And you have the right for peaceful assembly. Yeah. I guess they could argue that you're assembling in a place where the counter narrative is assembling. But at the same time, well, to me, just, it seems like if you breach inclusivity, you're inclusive of everybody, but you're inclusive of anybody, everybody, unless they have a different opinion, right? Right. Like we have freedom of expression. We have, yes, the right to, to assemble. That doesn't mean just one group can assemble. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And it's not like I'm even doing anything to provoke people. My sign says children cannot consent to puberty blockers. It doesn't say I hate you. It doesn't say you're awful. It doesn't say you're a liar. You're in a cult. It's a very anodyne factual statement. Children cannot consent to puberty blockers. The other sign I have is my definition of a dad, which is a human male who protects his kids from gender ideology. But I'm as peaceful as they come. I, I, I know I look ridiculous because I'm wearing signs, but I wear a sport coat and dress nicely to kind of balance that. And it probably confuses people, but I get a ton of respect out there and I have more support from more than 90% of the population for sure. Mm. So but, you mainly get support then? Oh yeah. Yeah. What, the people who hate me are incapable of having a conversation. Right. They cannot. I have not had one intelligent conversation from anyone in almost four years. And I've had probably 20,000 of these conversations out on the street and at university campuses. And the people on the other side of this argument have nothing intelligent to say. All they say every single time is that kids are going to kill themselves if we don't transition them. And that puberty blockers are reversible. Both two outrageous lies. It's totally outrageous. But the only way you can justify doing this abuse to kids is to say, well, if we don't, they're going to kill themselves. Where and is that how, coming from? Like, where, where is that? It's coming from people like Wallace Wong, that psychologist I mentioned, right. who gave the talk at the Vancouver Public Library where he's transitioning more than a thousand kids. And so is he was there talking to research backed up to say that they're going to like, what's the percentage of or likelihood I'll, of them committing suicide? I'll get to that. OK, no, it's not backed up. This psychologist, who's a government employee, literally said in this talk as he's talking to parents and kids, that if you're not getting the drugs and hormones you want right away, say you're suicidal. It works every time. We have the audio for this. We have the transcript for this. People can Google it. Google Wallace Wong and the bridgehead or Wallace Wong, trans kids, whatever. You'll find it. But it's totally outrageous. And there, of course, there's no data to support this. We have recently this year, we have one largest study that's ever been done out of Finland where they looked at more than 2,000 kids who went to the gender clinic, and they compared them to a control group of more than 17,000 kids. And in the 23 years that they looked at, from 96 to 2019, there were only seven suicides at the gender clinic. Works out to an annualized rate of 0.052%, one out of 2,000. And of course, that's terrible. Every suicide is awful. Of course. But yeah. this isn't some epidemic of suicides. And the rate was actually the same in the control group. And it wasn't because of gender. Most of those kids back then weren't getting these drugs, keep in mind. And we're told that if you don't give these kids these drugs, they're going to kill themselves. Most weren't getting any drugs back then. They were doing talk therapy and watchful waiting, as they should be doing. But the control group had a similar suicide rate. And the common denominator was, in both groups, other mental health comorbidities. Mm. Not gender, it's other mental health issues, obviously. If you're having strong mental health issues, yeah, your suicide rate's going to be a little higher. But there's no data to support it. It's a hideous lie. We have people like Laura Edwards Leeper, who started the first gender clinic in North America, in Boston, back in 2007. She admitted in the Washington Post, in an op-ed, that there's no epidemic of suicides. Erica Anderson, from World Professional Association of Transgender Health, says it's not true. Even Marcy Bowers has said it's not true. So we have all sorts of information. And the data we do have with the adult population shows that after sex reassignment surgery, suicides go up, not down. Best studies out of Sweden where suicides were 19.1 times higher than their peers 10 years after. Ouch. So it's just not true at all. But that's the only way you can get people to go along with this. These parents at these gender clinics will be told you can have a dead daughter or, or a live son. Right. They're being coerced. They're being manipulated. And they're being lied to. And no, puberty blockers are not reversible because time is not reversible. These boys end up with a micropenis for life. 
They're not going to suddenly go through puberty when they hit 19. Those years of development are gone. They've blocked the cure for gender dysphoria, which is puberty itself, growing up. And they've harmed these kids for life, and there's no going back. So it's just totally outrageous. How do you as a parent deal with something like that if you have a situation when your child is going through something like that and is on the border of making this decision and you sound like have no control over it well in, so, in canada so no one knows their children like their parents right but the first thing they need to do is they need to find out where this is coming from because this isn't coming from the kids themselves gender dysphoria as it used to be described gender identity disorder these were really effeminate little boys a lot of them grew up to be gay that's not what we're dealing with today in every case this is coming from some outside source indoctrinating these children. So it's coming from social media, it's coming from school, it's coming from their friend groups, it's coming from some online group. And you need to sever those connections. If they have friends who are pushing this on them, you need to sever those connections. You gotta protect your kid. Because this is serious stuff. This is not a game. Yeah. And sometimes you might need to move. I know a mom in Los Angeles, she worked in Hollywood, her daughter got into this. And she moved up into the mountains in California, lived on a, living on a farm. Her husband's still staying in Los Angeles to work and make money. But they had to get her daughter away from all these influences. And she's doing better now. So you've just got to separate them from the influences and just let time do its thing. Because as they grow up, as every woman watching this can relate to, puberty is hard mm -hmm. and it gets easier. I give speeches all the time and I ask the women in the audience, who here loved going through puberty? Not one arm has gone in the air. Mm -hmm. It's a tough time, and it can be tough for boys too. Mm -hmm. But it's coming from the environment somewhere, and so you need to s sever that connection. The most important thing you need to do, if it's gotten to that stage, you've already missed some important steps along the way. This should never have happened in the first place. You need to be proactive as your kids are growing up, and you need to tell them they're beautiful just as they are. You need to teach them a bit about this ideology at an age appropriate level, of course. My favorite thing to do, I still do it. I read to my kids at night. That's the best thing a parent can do. When you have kids, read to your kids every night. It's so fun. It's the best bonding moment you'll ever have. And maybe they're just trying to delay bedtime, but that's when things about their day come out and they tell you about what happened at school or whatever. And at the right moments, yeah, have conversations about this. And you tell your kids, if you hear the word gender mentioned at school, I want to know about it. So as soon as that's in school, you can nip it and go talk to the teacher. And every parent should be talking to the teacher anyway the first week of school. You should be getting to know your teacher a bit. And you should be telling them you're not okay with your kid learning gender ideology. Where do you stand on this? Because if you've got one of these teachers who's 24 years old and just got out of university and took gender studies and has blue hair, you've got a problem. And your kid's probably not safe in that class, especially if your child has autism. But it depends on the kid, depends on the scenario. Parents just got to be on top of it. You send your kids to Eastern Europe, uh, former Soviet Union. There you go. No problem at all. That's my This plan. isn't happening there. No. So if this was a biological thing, which some activists try to claim, why is it only a biological thing in liberal families in the West? This isn't happening much to conservative families. No, and it doesn't happen at all in Eastern Europe. Not at all. With that said, in Eastern Europe, it's not really... Like they're, they're, I wouldn't say they're welcoming of anything that's non-traditional when it comes to family values, like nothing at all. Um, it's a little bit like that's, that's the debate that I always have with people back home, um, even regarding, you know, gay people. It's like, are there really less gay people here or I don't know. I really don't know. Well, I would say no to that. Yeah. Now, there's also a contagion aspect to this. If you go to a high school here and you do a survey of all the kids, close to half of them are going to say they're LGBTQ just because it's cool. It's not cool now to be cis heteronormative. You know, Bill Maher? Yeah. He, he talked about there's like a chart of, of, I guess, how many people, the percentage of people who identified as LGBTQ plus over the years. And the number grew significantly. And there's like this debate does social contagion have anything to do with it? Because, I mean, it's only healthy to ask just when you see that chart, right? Sure. Because the numbers had gone yeah. up significantly. Yeah, Gen Z, apparently 20% are now LGBT. No, right. no, that's nonsense. Okay, it's just total nonsense. 
And as they grow up, you know, it's not going to be like that. I know tons of families where the kids, especially the girls, were saying they were a lesbian or they're non-binary and they're trans. And now they're 18 and they got a boyfriend. Right. This is a this is like a fad. It's a trend. It's a thing. But if this was some biological thing, obviously it would be the same all over. But it's not. You would see it more probably, yeah. And maybe like the the movement to I don't know to 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 have more of that everywhere in yeah. Eastern because it doesn't it doesn't exist there at all. Right. Again, there's certain things that are a little bit more rigid there on the other side, sure. but it's just you know. But but this distress is not something. If this was just biological and it was innate, which mm-hmm. activists try to say, well, you wouldn't be able to stop that. You know, mm-hmm. gay people in Eastern Europe might be in the closet, mm-hmm. but they're still gay. Mm-hmm. And you can define what a gay person is. You can't define what a trans person is. Mm-hmm. Nobody can. Nobody can define gender identity. They can't define gender. So I have this expression, there are two sexes, there are zero genders, and there are infinite personalities. Because that just sums everybody up. Because the left took gender, and they've tried to redefine it to mean something else entirely from sex. And that's nonsense. So we got to get back to basics. And that's two sexes, infinite personalities. My husband and I were laughing because, you know, the declaration cards that you fill out before entering a country, I don't think you have them anymore in Canada. They don't really make much sense, to be honest, but that's beside the point. Um, we were laughing because anywhere you land in Eastern Europe, there's the the line that says sex and there's only male and female. Right. That's it. Anywhere in Eastern Europe, that's those are just the only two options. Well, that's all there is. And then here, any application you fill out, anything like that, you open the chart even online and there's like... All these terms that <laughs> I'm like, I, English is not my first language. I don't, I don't, I don't know any of them. Yeah. The whole pronouns thing also confused me. I saw a comedian joke about that. Um, he, who's, you know, his first language wasn't English either, and he was talking about how, oh, you know, like when you're learning a new language, you learn I am, you are, he, she is. Like you learn how to use the pronouns with the right. What is that? The is the are. And he's yeah. like, do you know how long that took me to learn? Now you're asking me to, <laughs> to incorporate th- them. I just am so confused, you know? Yeah. And what message are you sending these kids when you affirm a girl as being a boy and you call her he, him? What message is she getting? The message she's receiving is she's supposed to be something different. That's not nice. That is not love. That's a message of self-hate. The way you were born is wrong and you need to change your body. That is a message of self-hatred. That's what they're affirming. But the left uses euphemisms and everything's upside down. So this is a hateful movement and we need to put a stop to it and we are putting a stop to it. One person at a time is waking up and this won't last. And I know in 10 or 20 years, we're gonna look back at this like we looked at lobotomies. And there's a lot of parallels between this and when they lobotomized people. The man who invented the lobotomy received the Nobel Prize in medicine. They took ice picks. That's what they are for practical purposes. They're just like ice picks. In through the orbital socket, into the prefrontal cortex, and jabbed away at the prefrontal cortex of the brain. And apparently some people got better. You know, maybe you had some psychotic people who calmed down. Well, (laughs) you're jabbing away at the brain. You don't know actually what you're doing. But this was totally insane. And that went on for a couple decades done to tens of thousands of people. And the, who popularized it? The media. Mm. Who popularizes this? The media. And kids are so impressionable. Right. Well, so they want to fit in, is. right? Like that yeah. we, as humans, have a need to fit in. But when you're a teenager, especially, and going through such a hard time to begin with, right. all you want to do is just fit in. So maybe there's also an aspect of in a way getting attention and that's the way you can get that attention you fit in when you come out and you say you know i want to transition or 100%. all of a sudden you feel loved you feel accepted because everyone around you your teachers are supporting you so you're hitting on another cultish aspect to this which is love bombing in all cults when someone first gets into it they get love bombed they get all this attention they're made to feel special it's the same with this you have these kids who are misfits who aren't fitting in these aren't the high school quarterbacks in the college and the cheerleaders. These are the kids who aren't fitting in, who aren't having a great time. But now they go to this after school gender and sexuality club, which all these schools have now. 
GSAs they're called. At what age are they allowed to oh, start that? Any age. Any age. Yeah. I mean, every high school will have one of these. Some of the elementary schools have them too. Elementary schools? Yes. In my kids' elementary school right now, there's a picture of a drag queen up on the wall. Why? In, in what world is that appropriate or helping any child? It's a cartoonish image, but still. Why? They brought in, and I pulled my daughter out, but they brought in an outside company, a third-party company called Salima Noon during Sex Education Week. And one of the things they were taught is that sometimes kids don't like their bodies. And if they don't like their bodies, well, you can change your body. What? You're, you're telling this to 10-year-olds. They brought in two trans people into a school assembly, grades four, five, and six. They're normalizing this for children who have no frame of reference. And so you got these misfit kids, these struggling kids. Now they're getting love bombed. They're getting all this attention. Now they have a special identity. That's why all these kids are identifying as LGBTQ, because it's special. And they're all being taught that, you know, we're colonizers and we're oppressors. White people are oppressors. And white men, of course, are the most oppressive at all. Right. But a white man can become the most oppressed overnight by just saying he's a woman. <laughs> and now his rights trump women's rights in women's spaces. This is all insane, but they're getting made to feel special. And now the whole school is celebrating them. So think about psychology here for a minute. Mm. You got this little girl. She was ignored. She was sad. She is depressed. She was depressed. But now she's getting all this love. Now the whole school knows she's really a boy. And they're all taught to celebrate it, to affirm it. So now you got a thousand kids affirming this. You got all the administrators and teachers in school affirming it. Maybe they're not even telling the parents. And they'll ask these kids sometimes, so sweetheart, do you feel comfortable telling your mom and dad? What goes through that kid's mind in that moment? Why wouldn't I want to tell my mom and dad? Right. Oh, yeah, they, yeah, they're probably going to be upset. Yeah, let's not tell them. This is the definition of grooming. It's not grooming into sexual stuff. It's ideological grooming, mm -hmm. for sure. And it's just so outrageous. No one knows their kids like their parents. And so conservatives and leftists, parents who get this, not all of the leftists, but most of them are on my side. Nobody knows their kid like a parent. Right. By the time your daughter's five years old, even, look at all the things you've been through together. Yeah. She's, she's your life. Yeah. All those times she's sick and you spend those sleepless nights laying beside her, helping to cool her down, hugging her while she's crying, cleaning up her bed after she's vomited on it. All the things you go through as parents, teaching them to ride a bike for the first time. You, you have this amazing life with your kids. And then some ideology comes along and teaches that she was born wrong and she's really a boy and we better not tell your parents because parents are a threat. They're treating parents by default as though they're a threat to their own kids. And how long have these people known these kids? The school counselors have known them for two sessions. The teacher has known them for one month, one week, and they only see them at school. And they're overruling parents? It's so outrageous. It's just so wrong. And when you're a parent, you get it too. But you're going to get it more when you're a parent, of course. And this just cannot continue because it's child abuse. And it's not one or two kids here and there. It's hundreds of thousands who now believe this. And it's mostly girls. So if this was innate, if this was biological, that wouldn't happen. It wouldn't have been mostly boys and now it's mostly girls. It's mm. a social contagion. Bulimia affected a handful of girls until it was written about and popularized. And it was put in the DSM. And media wrote about it. And now all these girls got it in their head. Oh, I can just throw up after my meals and I'll stay skinny. Boom. Hundreds of, hundreds of thousands. Millions. Whereas it didn't even affect them before because they didn't think about it. This is no different. So the media, that's why you should listen to more podcasts, long format. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of taken over, right? A lot of, a lot of the conversations that are happening, I think, 
that are being popularized in the world, media is losing it. I mean, they, they, they just are. Podcasts are becoming more and more popular, um, which is a good thing because you can actually listen to a long form conversation, get to know the person, understand what they're all about, their point of view, their opinion, the research, everything. So it's I think it's an amazing thing. But uh, damn it, Chris, this is some dark stuff. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, I can be fun sometimes, but it is dark, but there's positivity, too. And that's one of the reasons I started on this as well, because all of the conversation on this and we're just going over the basics today. Right. Right. But the, there's positivity and there's hope because parents know their kids. We need to give the positive message that our children are beautiful just as they are, that there's no right way to be a boy or a girl. That's a positive message that resonates with everybody, mm -hmm. no matter where they are in the political spectrum. Right. I get these people coming up to me on the street. I go to Granville Georgia all the time. That's where I hang out in Vancouver. And someone might come up super angry with me because how dare I have a sign that says children cannot consent to puberty blockers. And I stay calm as a cucumber. You and do stay really calm. I've seen, but you'd be like yelled at from all sides and you're just like standing there poised <laughs> like nothing is happening how do you do that yeah when i got my arm broken i didn't even say a word to them but i don't know it's, i i guess part of it's my constitution but i'm also used to it but I, I also know that and i tell people when they come out with me keep in mind i want you to imagine a million people are watching us mm. and act accordingly right because these videos are going to get seen by today a million two yeah sometimes 20 i've had some been seen 50 million times but a, just a normal, boring video today gets seen 500,000 times. So you just need to act like the respectful, normal person. It doesn't even matter what your words are. When other people see someone acting insane and angry and they see you acting like a professional, you've already won that argument. Never mind the words that are being spoken. But my strategy with the hostile people is to just say things they agree with and to ask them questions, the Socratic method of debate. Because they will all agree that there's no right way to be a boy or a girl. They will all agree that we shouldn't put kids in some stereotypical box. They all agree with that, but they don't see that they're pushing stereotypes to such a degree that they're telling children they now need to change their bodies to match the stereotypes of the opposite sex. So they'll all agree with that. And when you say things that they agree with, you bring down the temperature, you calm them down, but you also confuse them. And that confusion is beautiful because you're creating this moment of cognitive dissonance in their mind where there's now two competing ideas. They came into this conversation thinking, oh, this guy, he's a terrible bigot. He hates trans people. And then I say things that they can't help but agree with. They're going to have to go home and figure out what my position actually is. Right. And when you ask them questions, well, what is a trans person? And they can't answer it. What is gender identity? And they can't answer it. Just like Matt Walsh when he asked, what is a woman? And the leading authorities couldn't answer it. Right. Well, that's what needs to happen. And like I said about cults at the beginning of this, they self-police their own thoughts. They don't allow themselves to look at the evidence. No one ever came out of a cult because someone went up to them and told them they were wrong. They only come out because they start questioning things themselves. Because really that whole time they're in it, in the back of their mind, they have these doubts going. But they block their own doubts. Because to acknowledge the truth, for these trans activists to acknowledge what I'm saying, what would then happen? They're going to lose all their friends. They're going to blow up their whole social circle. They're going to have to confront their pride that they were so wrong about something so terrible. And it's too much for them to confront. And for parents, especially who have transitioned their kids, they'll never be able to acknowledge this. Right. Because then they'd have to acknowledge that I abused my own child. Yeah. Which is a hard pill to swallow. Right. Moreover, I think your whole worldview will have to shatter, right? Which is a very scary thing for a lot of people. Right. When you've made up conclusions, opinions, based off of the information that you got, and you're very set in your own ways, for many people it's scary to have their whole worldview shattered, right? Because everything, all of right. a sudden, everything that you think, everything that you have in here, that you've made up over the course of however many you know months or years, is just gonna shatter. And a lot of these things also, you know, relate to an evil force. And I think a lot of us don't want to believe. Like I, for the longest time, just dismissed a lot of these things because I didn't even almost want to believe that such evil exists out there, right? right. That 
how it's affecting children can be that evil and, and that could actually be happening until I was like, wait a minute, something's not right. Let's look into this a little bit more, you know? And then you realize that, yeah, it does exist, you know? With many things, you know, you look yes. at even, you know, the World Economic Forum, right? Like for the longest time, I was like, no, that can't be real. And then you go on their website and you read it on their website and you're like, oh my God, it's yeah. so true. All of my conspiracy friends were right, you know? And look at, look at history, look at world history. I've just watched this documentary, Hitler and the Nazis, Evil on Trial. And it goes through the whole evolution from after World War I and the Treaty of Versailles, all the way to his rise of, to power and then it cuts every once in a while to the Nuremberg trial with actual audio. And it's probably the best program I've seen on him. But the entire society was celebrating him. Mm. Were they all evil? Was the entire population evil? No. They were propagandized. Right. They were manipulated. And psychologically, you know, we think we're this advanced society because look at this amazing city we're in right now. And look at all the technology we have. But psychologically, we are the same as people who lived in caves 5,000 years ago. Right. And humans are easily manipulated and propagandized. And this is just another one of these things. Right. It, that's all it is. People have been deceived. They're lied to. And sometimes the bigger the lie, the more people believe it. This lie is coming from everywhere. It's coming from every leftist government. It's coming from the UN, the WHO. It's in schools. It's pushed by our government. It's pushed by every union. Well, all the unions, of course, are run by communists. And they're all pushing this. I had a protest in Toronto last September. And beforehand, the Canadian Labour Congress, or whatever it's called, representing about 100 different unions. They had union reps from about 100 different unions on a Zoom call. And they organized a counter-protest for my gender protest. We're talking about the electrical workers union, the steel workers union, <laughs> who represent all these guys, these blue collared dudes, every one of whom would support me pretty much. But the union bosses are all communists. Why do we still have unions in Canada? Like it's. Oh, we're a, we're one of the biggest union countries there are. About a third of all workers are in a union. Mm. And that has a huge impact on society as well, right. because the workers are propagandized. My wife is a teacher. She's sent propaganda from the BCTF about voting for the NDP. They shouldn't be doing that. But that's the way it is. That's how they all run. So, and they're the ones pushing this. And so we got a big fight on our hands. But the positive message, the message of light, not darkness, is that we're right. We got truth on our side. And the truth spreads for free. They've got hundreds of millions of dollars, probably billions, has been spent trying to push this ideology all across the West. And we got a handful of parents who decided to take this upon themselves. I've done this with no money because it's just the truth. And it snowballs and it compounds. And especially when I went into the, to the States, I started making friends down there. And I work with all the biggest conservative organizations down there now. I got Moms for Liberty going on this. That's 130,000 moms who are now fighting this. In the States, there are a lot more um, gung-ho about protecting yeah. things and speaking that, up. And I find, I find people right. in the States are a lot more open to having conversations, disagreeing. Like, it's much harder to disagree with people in Canada yeah. and have a debate, I find, than it is in the States. In the States, people don't care. They'll just tell you whatever they think and you'll have a conversation. And of course, you know, there's... there's it's true. Far more violence happens to me up here. It, when I go to a university here, it's going to be crazy. I can go to a university there and people will at least talk to me and we're always portrayed to be like this very peaceful nation and you know right. no nothing like that could ever happen you know we're always the peacekeepers and yet you're experiencing more violence in canada than well the far left today is is fascist right. they call themselves anti-fascists but who's the one who are using violence fascism is using violence to push your political agenda who's using violence it's all the far left i've been assaulted about 35 times 35 times i've been arrested twice here at granville georgia after getting assaulted what a union rep came and hit me after i went it was in october of 2020 when i first started i was surrounded by all these antifa people they wouldn't let me walk there were three dozen police officers right there i went to talk to them they wouldn't do anything about it second time i walked into the art gallery you know the big public square there there were about three different protests going on and i'm just out to talk to people and a guy came and knocked my phone out of my hand i got surrounded again 
police said they didn't see it. They were all watching from 15 feet away. Then a third time, after t talking to these police for a minute, as this officer was telling me, I'm telling you not to go into that square, into that public square. I said, are you telling me I can't walk freely in Canada just because I have a sign that some people like? He said, I'm not saying anything. And this other police officer, Constable Blackman is his name, said, this is a safe space, man. And I was naive at the time. <laughs> safe space is code word for the left, meaning safe for the LGBTQIA2S++, not safe for me. Right. So a third time I walked off the sidewalk 10 feet. People were wandering all around me and a union rep named Robert Ages came and hit me. And instantly I was handcuffed, taken to jail, charged with causing a disturbance. I hadn't said a word. And I was banned from walking on all these streets in the center of Vancouver for about six months until the Crown Prosecutor threw out the charge. And then two months later, I was sucker punched there. I stopped the guy from running away. So like a citizen's arrest kind of thing. And police arrested me. They ended up releasing me. But then a few months later, I got this phone call and they were wanting to charge me with assault because after this guy sucker punched me and stunned me a bit, I gave him a single push to stop him from running away. Mm -hmm. And I guess I, it hurt him because I pushed him into a wall and they were trying to charge me with assault causing bodily harm. They wanted me to come in and give a statement. My lawyer said, no, don't do it. They're just trying to build a case against you because mm -hmm. again, the police are not in favor of me here. But I vowed then and there, I'm never touching anyone again. If I get punched, I'm just going to take it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. And a week later, I got my arm broken in Montreal, but I never said a word to these people. I got jumped by six or seven guys on St. Catherine Street, the busiest pedestrian street in Montreal at 7 p.m. on a Friday night, one hour before their curfew. Because, of course, they had a curfew because everyone right. has to get inside during COVID where it spreads even more quickly, right? Right. <laughs> the science. But, yeah, it's totally insane. And I get a lot more support from police as well in the U.S. I've had, in Boston, I had probably 200 police officers come out to a protest that I had. And they actually keep the crazies away from the normal parents and grandparents. Mm -hmm. Whereas they don't practice any crowd control here in Canada, as we saw in March of last year when I was assaulted. I think you saw that. Had these two men who say they're women yelling F you, F you, F you in my ears as I'm giving an interview to a journalist. And then I got punched and pulled and pushed and police did nothing. I saw somebody say that, uh, you know, the argument for that was, well, you entered a protest that was like a totally opposing view <laughs> of yours. Oh. Which we kind of chatted about that So earlier, that, that gives you know? them license to commit violence, does it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good argument. Right? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? You you were literally just standing there with us. I saw the video. We yeah. can maybe play it. You know, and I'd I walked away in. from them a couple times because I was trying to give this interview and they wouldn't leave me alone. So twice I'd walked away. But they surrounded me again. I'd already been assaulted. I'd been assaulted within 30 seconds of getting there. My nose was bleeding. Because I got pushed and they hit my sign up into my face, which made my nose bleed. So I called the police and this young woman arrived, a police officer. And I said to her, and this is all on video. I have every single second on video. I said, I should be able to walk freely in Canada without getting assaulted. And she said, well. <laughs> so I knew right then I had a problem and she was just a total disgrace. So she's being investigated now. There's actually an internal investigation going on into the police conduct. I found out just last week they did end up arresting that guy about a week later. Mm -hmm. They tried to press charges, but the Crown Prosecutor wouldn't approve the charge. It's outrageous. It's so clear-cut. It's all on video. There were three dozen police officers there watching it. I was technically already getting assaulted when I got punched there. Because you're not allowed to walk up to someone two inches from their ear and scream over and over and over. All the police were just watching that. They could have just said, hey, back up. Yeah. Give him a space. Just, we're here to protect the peace of this protest, That's right? right? Yeah. But what happened as I was falling down? That same female officer, smiling ear to ear. It's on video. She's watching the whole thing and she's smiling. She loved it. She Afterwards, she said it was a mutual fight and that I was instigating, that I was yelling at them. It's all on video. Do you have a videographer with you who films everything? Uh, no, normally, it's just myself. Mm. I set up my camera, my phone on a tripod slash selfie stick thing that folds out. Once in a while, people come out with me. When I travel, especially because I travel all over, Oftentimes, media will come out with me now. And that day, there was an independent journalist there. So he was filming as well as, my, as I was filming. So mm -hmm. it's all on camera. There's no debate here. But it is what it is. 
Well, I think we're at our time, yeah. but any closing statements for, for parents who are maybe feeling a little bit in distress? I know you gave a little bit of a high level, you know, to get a little bit more involved in what your child is doing, but anything else you want to share that could help or could Look, just give my message is, is always the same. There's no such thing as a transgender child. They're called girls and boys. And the positive message we should be sending is that they're beautiful just as they are. So teach that message to your kids and they'll be fine. Thank, thank you, you for Chris. Me. Thank you for coming on. And thank you to our wonderful listeners to tuning into this episode. I will see you next week. Bye.